All right, here we are. Um, series Elders, Deacons, Preachers, Saints. This is lesson number 11 in that series, the role of the preacher. Last couple of lessons we were talking about the role of the elder and uh, how to select elders and their tasks in the church. We move on today to the role of the, role of the preacher, the evangelist, the minister. Um, in an article that appeared in the uh, Christian Chronicle a while back, Dr. Bill Jones, the late Dr. Bill Jones, uh, described some of the different roles or models that preachers have taken on through the years. Very interesting. And he lists these. First, he calls one model the pulpiteer model. Uh, and the pulpiteer model is the classic pulpit preacher who you know, preached. Whenever he taught a class, he preached. Uh, uh, whenever he did counseling, he was actually preaching to you one-on-one. -on -one. And the congregational life uh, flowed around this uh, individual, around the pulpit, and the pulpit preacher, pulpiteer style. Another style of, uh, uh, for the preacher was the uh, preacher as educator. Um, congregations became aware of the great need for education and they began developing educational programs. And so the preacher became a teacher, and when he preached, he explained and he taught, he developed ideas, and so he became the chief educator for the congregation. Another style of preacher was the preacher as program director. Preacher as program director, you know, the, the preacher becomes like the director of the YMCA. Make sure that everybody is involved somehow. Everybody's busy. Um, the pulpit became a tool for promoting activities and involvement, and it did have some teaching. But the main idea was to let's get people involved and let's get people busy. And uh, usually the pulpit preacher became the chief, uh, uh, the chief organizer for, for stuff going on in the, in the congregation. Um, the preacher is activist. The 60s brought an awareness for the need for social change and social improvements. And so the preacher becomes the focal point for addressing the ills of society and a, a motivator for the solution to the big problems. And especially in African American churches, you know, their preachers became activists and still to this day, many of them, you know, they're called reverend but uh, they don't do a whole lot of preaching. They're more uh, active in the civil rights movement. Uh, then we have the uh, preacher as the manager and CEO of the congregation. Uh, reaching the unchurched becomes a big theme in the 80s and the 90s. So you get the uh, preacher as the church growth seminar giver and the expert um, uh, on uh, church matters. Uh, and preachers uh, are goal setters and they're program managers and uh, uh, decision makers in the uh, congregation. Another role that preachers have, and I'm not saying you know, um, uh, this is necessarily in, in order, I'm just, you know, this is in any order, all right? Uh, but you have the preacher as the resident theologian. Let's face it, if you're a preacher, you've got, you may have a flexible schedule which permits you to perhaps go to school. Uh, and uh, so a lot of preachers go back to school, they get advanced degrees and so on and so forth and it becomes ask the preacher. He becomes the resident expert. Um, and you know, more battles between churches take place because preachers begin to shape doctrinal points of view and lead the fight to have their ideas and their views imposed on other people. They begin to publish magazines and so on and so forth with their particular ideology. And then of course, perhaps the most popular one, certainly among evangelical churches and old line denominations, the preacher as the pastor. A uh, preacher as a pastor. You know, I could add to this list the preacher as pastor or elder with responsibility for counseling and shepherding, uh, even more than for defending the faith. I remember uh, one congregation where I went to work at and I was replacing you know, you know, the pulpit preacher, this individual left, and I took his place. And when I got there, the elders told me now, 
You know, they, wanted, they asked me, how are your counseling skills? And I said, well, you know, I, I do some counseling, pastoral type counseling, but I mean, you know, can you handle you know, a heavy load of counseling? And I asked, why? Well, they told me because the previous minister, that's what he did. That was the mainstay of his congregation. He had appointments. You know? He was counseling, doing counseling. The preacher has counseling. He didn't have a counseling degree. He wasn't licensed. But if you're a minister, uh, you ne you know, it's, part of the, it's, it's, it's part of your task. People come to you for help and so on and so forth. And so this particular individual converted his ministry, his preaching ministry, into a counseling ministry. Uh, not a good idea, by the way. You know, one of the first things you learn when you go to preacher school is you're not trained to be a professional counselor, leave the counseling to the professionals. You, know, you can do pastoral counseling, encouragement, spiritual development, things like that. But if someone comes to see you and, and says they have problems, they have, they're, they're very depressed, they have suicidal tendencies, that's the time to call the pros. You know, don't, don't tackle those things. But anyways, just to give you an idea, the many various roles and images that preachers have had throughout the uh, years. Now, of course, there's an element of truth in each of these uh, roles because preachers are involved to a certain degree in every one of these areas. You know. But like elders and deacons, the Bible should determine who and what a preacher is and who and what a preacher does rather than uh, tradition or human invention uh, or the need of the moment. So let's take a look at what the Bible says about this role. Several terms that refer to the preacher in the Bible. Um, first is minister, a common, uh, a common term. Uh, the Old Testament used this word, which meant to serve in any capacity, but especially in the sense of worship. So uh, in the Old Testament, when they talked about minister, they, they meant serving at the altar, serving in the temple. The New Testament uses this word in the same way, but it became the term for someone who served in some capacity in the church, more generalized. For example, in Ephesians 6, 21, Paul says, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, more general in that sense. Today it's used to refer to someone who serves the church usually in a paid capacity. Yes, we all minister in some way. Yes, we all have ministries in, in various areas. But when you're talking about the minister, you're usually talking about the full-time minister, the individual who's paid uh, to carry out certain roles. Uh, another term, preacher, uh, has this term in the Old Testament. Old Testament usage came from a word that originally meant to gather together as an assembly. Then the word developed to refer to the one who actually called the group together. And then it referred to the one who spoke uh, or the speech that was given at the assembly. So you know, like Bible words, you know, they go through an evolution of, of meaning. So at first, calling the meeting, then it meant the meeting, then it meant the, the, the one who was speaking at the meeting, and then it meant the speech given at the meeting. So it kind of evolved. In the New Testament, uh, the word refers to the one who proclaims the message of the gospel. So the idea is that a preacher is not a proclaimer of just any philosophy or any message, but exclusively of the gospel message. So the word meant to proclaim. So someone could be proclaiming anything, actually, the king's edict or you know, some new philosophy, but ultimately it came to mean the one who was proclaiming the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, so um, today the term preacher refers to the one who gives the sermon on Sunday. Who's your preacher? You're expecting him to be the one who uh, preaches from the pulpit. Um, another term is the term evangelist. Um, this is a New Testament word not found in the Old Testament. It's made up of two words. Uh, the first is good and the other word is to announce. And it means one who announces good news or who proclaims the good news of the gospel. 
Another word coined in the New Testament to refer to the, to the preacher. Today, the term applies to one who does meetings, not necessarily involved in local work. So, I mean, some, peop some people have to get a handle on, on what words mean and how they use them in what context. So, uh, the preacher is the guy who's in your church every Sunday giving the sermon. The evangelist is the guest speaker, the one who goes around, if you wish, from place to place. He you know, speaks at meetings or uh, conventions or lectureships and things like that. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that, but we've made it mean that. We rarely call our preacher our evangelist. We usually call our local uh, worker who does the preaching from the pulpit, we usually refer to him as the preacher. So suffice to say that all these terms refer to the preacher. Minister, referring to him as one who serves the Lord and the Lord's people. Preacher, referring to the kind of ministry he performs as opposed to the elders or the deacons. And evangelist, referring to the tool of his ministry and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of salvation. All right. So let's talk about uh, qualifications, shall we? You know, we're following the same pattern that we did for elders and deacons, talk about what the term means and so on and so forth, and then kind of move along and talk about uh, qualifications and uh, tasks. So qualifications, unlike elders and deacons, there are no neat passages that list the qualifications of preachers. And so we look at the preachers themselves in the New Testament to help us determine you know, what we're looking for. You know, for elders, you know, we, we've got lists, you know, qualifications, First Timothy and Titus, you know, we've got qualifications. And deacons, Acts 6 and, other, and Timothy, you know, we've got lists of, of, of things to look for. You know, I've even given you those lists. You know, we use checklists you know, when we're we're, 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 we're looking at different men to fulfill this role. We have a checklist because you know, the Bible gives us a checklist. But for preachers, there is no checklist. There is no one chapter that gives a lot of the details, the qualifications of, of, of preachers. Now in the beginning, the apostles, they fulfilled all the roles. You know, at the beginning, the, uh, the apostles, they were the elders, they were the deacons, they, were the, you know, they did it all. And with time, they developed men who would carry out these roles as individuals. Elders and deacons, as I say, have lists of qualifications to guide us. Preachers have models. Okay, that's the distinction I want to make. Elders and deacons have lists. Preachers have models. So in the New Testament, we have many who did the work of evangelism, the work of the preacher. So if we want to understand, you know, what qualifications does that individual have to have? We have to look at the models provided for us in the New Testament. So for example, we have of course the very first uh, example of it, the unknown brethren who scattered from Jerusalem and went everywhere preaching the word in Acts after, chapter eight, verse four. Right, there was a persecution in Jerusalem and so the brethren scattered and as they scattered, they proclaimed the gospel. They were the first, quote, preachers, if you wish. Not a lot of information about them, simply that they went forth and they shared the word. Um, another early example is Philip. Philip, who began, as, who began as a deacon and then developed into preaching. So what about Philip? We know that he performed signs, Acts chapter eight, 12 to 17. We know that he preached in many places to many people. We have the story, very familiar story in Acts chapter eight of the eunuch. And we know that he was married and had children, right? His daughters were gifted, Acts chapter two. So we know about Philip and some of the things that he did. Uh, Barnabas, another one who preached, traveled and preached with Paul on his first missionary journey, Acts chapter 13, verse one, and other places. We know about Barnabas. Um, we have a lot of information about Timothy, whom Paul discipled and trained for ministry, Acts chapter 16, verse two, another model for us to look at. And Titus, Timothy and Titus, who was also trained by Paul as well. Read about him in the 
epistle to Titus. And then there's Apollos, who was converted by Aquila and Priscilla, but did great work in defending the faith and strengthening the church. We read about him in Acts chapter 18 and 1 Corinthians chapter 3. All of these models, you know, individuals who modeled for us the work of the preacher. And then of course there are the other preachers referred to or named in Paul's letters of whom we have no details, no details anyways, in the scriptures themselves. So when we do examine the models, there are things that we see. We see first of all that there is a diversity of men. They're all men, but there's a diversity of men. For example, you have a young man, Timothy, and you have an older man, Barnabas. You have Jews like Philip and Greeks like Timothy. You have individuals who are married and individuals who are single. You have individuals who are well-educated like Apollos and trained through discipleship and tutoring like uh, Titus. And all of these were preachers and all of these had common experiences. So what was the common experience or what were the common experiences of these men? Well, first of all, they all felt called. In the Old Testament, the calling of God was done in special ways through signs and wonders of God's appearances. Moses, you know, he saw the, the burning bush and Isaiah, the image of heaven, right? Now in the time of Jesus and the apostles, a call to ministry was still done with a sign, you know, like Paul's being blinded and the Lord speaking to him, or perhaps through the reception of special gifts. But um, there were also ordinary ways that men were still called into the ministry. For example, Philip was chosen by the church as a deacon and then developed into being an evangelist, a preacher. Barnabas, for example, was moved to generosity by the need of the early church and then he was selected to help the church in Antioch, which led to his choice to go on a mission journey. Doesn't that sound familiar? Don't you know people who had a variety of experiences that led them into preaching? They were in school and uh, you know, uh, studying to be architects or something, and then they went to a meeting and a young Christians meeting or something on campus and, and they were fascinated and they took a Bible class and then the Bible teacher uh, was trying to put together a mission team going to Mexico for the summer and they figure, yeah, that's a great idea and all of a sudden, you know, two years later, whoops, they're out of the architect program and they're into the missions program and, and they decide to become missionaries. We, we see that all the time. That, that's what happened in my own life. You know, Marty was in the military and left the military and decided to go to preacher school. So you know, you're not born that way. You're not born eight years old, decide you're going to be a preacher. Your experiences, they, they lead you to you know, a point where you have to make a decision. You know, am I going to do this or not? And, and if you talk to men who have gone into ministry and you ask them about that decisive point, what, what led them to that? Was it because they felt they were great speakers? They had just the you know, tremendous ability for speaking or that they felt exceptionally intelligent and they could just debate somebody? I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fairly certain that if you talk to them, they'll say, well, I, I, just, I just felt that I was called to this. I just, I just sensed that this is something that I had to do. And for many people, it doesn't make any sense to do it. You know, like you know, they've got good jobs and they're solid and they've got money socked away and if they just stick at this particular job and you know, they're going to you know, rise up through the company and, and they've got all kinds of security locked in. You know, maybe they're working for a, a large corporation or for the government or something like that. And then all of a sudden they decide, well, no, I, I feel a calling to go in the ministry. And then they spend the rest of their lives raising money and begging people to give them money so that they can go to some obscure country in Africa or South America or somewhere you know, to go preach the gospel. 
It doesn't make any sense to anyone else except themselves. It makes sense to them. They, they, they felt called. They felt that God had laid this on their hearts. This was just something they, they had to do. And so all of these men felt called in some way. Uh, Timothy and Titus, you know, uh, both of them were chosen and they were trained in the ministry by Paul. And Apollos was encouraged by Paul to strengthen the church at Corinth. So all of them felt called, but not a calling like you see a cross in the sky or a voice or something like that, not like that. Those type of things happened, of course, in the Old Testament, but most, I would say, all preachers today the calling is through you know, circumstances that work together in some way, or, or perhaps a, a burden you know, to, 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 to uh, uh, go out into the world and, and share the gospel. I, I remember my own call in a sense, a sense of burden happened when I was, on a, uh, I was on a bus. I was on a bus in Montreal. I had just, I'd been a Christian for a little while, and there were two girls sitting right across from me and uh, they were speaking in French, but of course I speak French, so I understood what they were saying, and they were talking you know, fairly loudly, so I, you know, I, I could hear what they were saying. And they were talking to each other about, well, you know, we're going to the club tonight, we're going to the nightclub, it's going to be great, and I hope my boyfriend is there, and he's so cute, and this and that, and okay, fine, you know, whatever. And, but then she says, and you know, I think maybe you know, uh, we've gone out, and I've known him for like the three weeks or something like that, and uh, I'm thinking maybe we should move in together and you know, do blah, blah, blah. And, and they were talking about stuff, and then they were talking about soap operas on TV and you know, what, what is so-and-so and such-and-such -and -such soap opera is going to do. And, and in my mind, at that moment, I said to myself, this person does not have a clue. Absolutely clueless to what life is really about to what reality, I mean reality is. You know, there's heaven, there's hell, there's God. God demands certain things from us, that we are sinners, that we should seek God with all of our hearts and minds and souls. She was clueless. And, and you know, in my own mind, you know, it was like, boy, somebody has just got to tell these people about the gospel. You know? and, and then another little voice came and said, well, what about you, hotshot? You know? <laughs> if you're so smart, <laughs> why don't you do it? And I could never have, I never had an answer to that challenge. If you know what the truth is, and if you know what reality is, and if you're so sure about all of this, what are you doing riding the bus listening to her conversation without doing anything about it? And so it was a lot of those type of self-talks you know, that eventually directed me into you know, going into ministry, uh, married with children already, deciding to go back to college with three little kids and no future, no guarantee of finances, no pension, zero, nothing, except a wife who said, if we do this, are we seeking first the kingdom? And I said, yes, let's do it, she said. Let's do it. So I'm sure that if I called on Dayton or others you know, who have been in the preaching ministry in their lives, they could have a similar story. They felt called. Each of the men that I've just talked about heard and obeyed the gospel and was serving in some way when they were called to serve through the ministry of the word. There's very little that these men have in common other than the fact that they felt call to go into preaching and they were encouraged in their desire by someone in the church. I'm talking about these people that I've just listed here, Barnabas and so on and so forth. And I can say that in my own experience. The feedback I got from the church where I was attending at the time was positive. 
people were saying, yes, you can do this, yes, you, you have the skills to do this, yes, we'll, you know, we'll pray for you, we'll encourage you in this. So from what I see in the New Testament, in my own experience and that of others, there comes a need to do this which will not be satisfied by something else. And that need to do this is then followed by the encouragement of a teacher or a parent or a preacher or an elder or someone in the church that says, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, you can do it. So important. So they felt called. Secondly, they were trained. In each case of these men, there was a period of formal and informal training. Philip, for example, served as a deacon. Barnabas worked with Paul and, and different churches before going out on missions. Timothy and Titus were also trained by the apostle Paul. Apollos had formal training in Alexandria, but he was taught by Aquila and Priscilla, more perfectly, the gospel of Christ. And each spent time in some way developing their faith and their skills. Today, we have Bible schools and uh, preaching, uh, preaching schools, we have colleges, but we should be aware that the local congregation is still the best place to train preachers. There are things in the local congregation that you learn simply by being a member and by serving and interacting with people that you learn that you cannot learn at the university or in the preaching school. I remember a friend of mine uh, who said, uh, you know, he was a preacher, he had gone to a, a preaching school and he says, when I got out of preaching school and he went to uh, the, the mission field, he said, I had all the answers. I had memorized them, I had written them down, I had all the answers. And when I got to the mission field, there was a problem. And I said, what was the problem? He said, nobody was asking questions that I had the answers to. <laughs> yeah, he, he had to learn. He had to learn about the church on the ground. So let's never replace the local assembly as the incubator and as the training ground, the best training ground for preachers. Absolutely, I'm not saying anything against Bible colleges, preaching schools, I'm a product of you know, Oklahoma Christian. I got a great education there. They taught me many, many things, how to handle the word and so on and so forth. But like anything else, you, know, you have to be in the local church to really begin to hone your skills as a preacher. And, and, and what I'm saying, these men that we talk about here in the same way were trained in the local assemblies. And then they were commended. The preachers in the New Testament were commended by apostles or elders. Philip was commended by the apostles in Acts 6, Barnabas by the prophets and the teachers in Acts 13, Timothy by Paul and the elders in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Titus by Paul, uh, we, we read about that in Titus, and Apollos was also commended by Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. So the, the call to preach followed by training in the word and its application in the church work should be confirmed by church leadership. You know, the, the fact that this man has a call and is able in the word, that's the commendation of the church, the commissioning of the church. And this is what legitimate, uh, legitimizes his ministry, his call and his training. When I went into ministry full time, full time ministry, it's all I did. The, the, the church where I began uh, commended me to service by the laying on of hands and the prayers of the leaders. They were saying to the church and to the world, this man, we commend this man here because we believe that his training is sufficient, his skills are sufficient, his life is sufficient to now go into this ministry full time and we recognize that. That's a biblical idea, that's not just a tradition, that's a biblical idea and a very important idea. You know, some people think that just wanting to preach is enough or going to college is enough or somebody giving you a job is enough. But being a preacher involves a process that includes all three elements, the calling, the training, and the confirming in ministry. And I might add that a preacher remains qualified so long as his life and doctrine remain pure. That's, that's how you 
stay, you don't have to renew your membership, but your teaching has to remain biblical and your life must remain pure if you wish to continue serving in this type of work. All right, let's take a look at the work of the preacher. Three broad categories. First, preach the gospel. Paul says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. First task always to preach the word. This is the responsibility for proclaiming the word of God to the world. The methods and the audience changes from culture and time, but the objective is always the same. Bringing human beings face to face with the message of the gospel, that's the job one of the preacher. Now, how he does it? Oh, film strips, personal work, TV evangelism, pulpit preaching, missions, books, videos, radio, internet. Each preacher has a variety of ways and abilities to reach out to as many as possible with God's word. The preacher is responsible for sowing the seed. That's his job. He has to sow the seed, first and foremost. Why? Because if there's no seed sowing, there's no harvest. There's got to be seed sowing before there is a harvest. I remember working for another church that, uh, fill, you know, or, or talking to a church that was talking about their preacher and they were talking about his his, uh, his uh, not resume, but his work schedule. And they had, boy, they had that guy down, you know, every hour of the day was booked because they wanted to make sure he was busy earning his keep. So they had him you know, chairing this meeting and that meeting and going here and doing that and reports and you know, fixing the light bulbs and you know, organizing the Boy Scouts on Tuesday night, you know what I'm saying, busy stuff. And once you had all this done, you know, well, let's see if you can squeeze in a little preaching there. <laughs> it's the reverse. <laughs> Some people say, why are the churches of Christ shrinking? Well, not enough sowed, seed sowing, that's why they're shrinking. You can't have a harvest if you don't see, sow the seed. If you don't preach the gospel, how are you going to expect people to be baptized? This is the primary work of the preacher. And we do the church harm when we don't provide the time and the resources to allow him to do this thing. Secondly, I need to move here, sorry about that, I'm falling behind, um, to set the church in order. In Titus, Paul says, for this reason I left you in Crete that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Now the reason Titus had to appoint elders is because the New Testament church, the elders were the main teachers. Listen to me now, I know we're almost at the end. The, I believe that the Bible teaches that the church model is that the church is elder led. They're not these anonymous guys who have meetings every couple of weeks you know, to decide up and down on the budget and stuff like that. A New Testament church is elder led. They are visible, they are active, they are there, you know them. So the elders are the main teachers, leaders, ministers, and it was necessary to select and appoint them because this is what the church needed to get going. In many churches, elders serve as a, as I say, a kind of super, supervisory board overseeing the work of the evangelist. This system is out of balance and not according to the New Testament. Again, it's why churches don't grow. The preacher's job is to establish and organize the church according to the New Testament pattern so that the elders and the deacons can do their work. Thirdly, the preacher ministers the word. He says, but as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. 
Paul's instructions to both Timothy and Titus include information that help these preachers minister to the spiritual needs of the brethren, whether it be in the form of teaching or encouragement, <clears throat> excuse me, rebuke, correction, the work of the preacher is to help the congregation accurately apply God's word to every situation in their lives. So the key to the success of the preacher's work, therefore, is the response of the congregation. What does the congregation do? Well, first of all, the church needs to respond to the call to share the gospel and support its preaching through financial giving and involvement. So that's, that's a no-brainer. And then the church also needs to agree that it will submit to the word, not to the preacher. All of us, including preachers and deacons, we are in submission to the eldership, to the leaders of the congregation. But all of us, including the elders and the preacher, are in submission to the word of God. And the task of the preacher is to make sure that that word is preached accurately and fervently and sincerely to the congregation. So the church needs to agree that it will submit to the word, not the preacher, insofar, that, uh, insofar as the way it should function is concerned. A submissive church responds to the message of the preacher when called upon uh, to repent if that's necessary, or to give it's, if that's what it is, or to grow, or to share, or to rise up, whatever it is. And that's the work of the preacher. If you, if you look at the preacher's job description, that was a, that's the term I was looking for before. It ought to be, well, he's busy preaching over here and uh, he's organizing a thing over here to make sure that the word gets out to the community. And then over here, he's doing something to make sure that the word is being cast out you know, using technology or he's teaching this person or he has a class to teach. You know, it's, the word of God has to be the, the verb in all the sentences you know, that describe his work. Otherwise, the church is out of balance. The church to find its balance. Elders need to lead in ministry. Deacons need to serve in ministry. Preachers need to preach the word, teach the word, proclaim the word, spread the word. Okay, next week, next time, we're going to talk about the saints, so elders, deacons, preachers, next week, saints. All right, thank you for your, thank you for your attention.